Chapter Seventeen of Sir Titus Salt, Baronet, His Life and Its Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. Sir Titus Salt, Baronet, His Life and Its Lessons, by Robert Belgarni. Chapter Seventeen. In joys, in grief, in triumphs, in retreat, great always, without seeming to be great. Roscommon. Generous is brave, affection, kindness, the sweet offices of love and duty, were to him as needful as his daily bread. Rogers. In the last chapter, the reader has been made acquainted with Sir Titus Salt's private occupations at Crow Nest. But as building operations were always claiming his attention at Saltaire, let us see what improvements are going forward there. The town still continued to grow, though when each new addition was completed he would say, I've finished now. Yet soon afterwards some other local want was perceived, which he proceeded to supply. One of these was a recreation ground for the workpeople. We have already seen the provision made in various ways for their welfare, but open-air amusements being an essential condition of health, he, therefore, resolved to provide the salt-air park. It is situated on the north side of the air, and within five minutes' walk of the town. The area enclosed for the purpose contains fourteen acres, and the tastes of old and young have been thoughtfully considered in the plan of its arrangement. One half of the ground is beautifully laid out in walks and flower beds, and separated from the other half by a broad gravel terrace, in the center of which is a music pavilion for the band. The largest portion of the park is devoted to cricket, croquet, and archery. The river, as it approaches the park, has been widened, so that boating, bathing, and swimming may be enjoyed with safety. There is no charge for admission. No person is allowed to enter or remain there in the state of intoxication. No intoxicating drinks are to be consumed there. No profane or indecent language, gambling, or pitch and toss are allowed nor any meeting for the purpose of making religious or political demonstrations without special permission. The ceremony of formally declaring the park open took place on the 25th of July, 1871, in the presence of a large concourse of spectators. The works at Saltaire were stopped a little earlier to give the work people an opportunity of being present at the ceremony. When the volunteers, with their brass band, had entered the park, the gates were thrown open to the public. Sir Titus, accompanied by several members of his family, occupying a place on the pavilion. Mr. Edward Salt, on behalf of his father, said that the park was bequeathed to them and their successors, and it was hoped they would long enjoy it for the purposes of recreation and amusement. He called their attention to the regulations of the park, and hoped that each would see it to be their duty to observe them. Sir Titus said that he was very sorry that Lady Salt was unable to be present to declare the park open, but her eldest daughter would do it in her stead. Miss Salt then declared the park duly open to the public. A fer de joie was then fired by the volunteers amid loud and prolonged cheers. The bells in the church rung out a merry peal, and the band struck up the national anthem. Sir Titus and the party then walked round the park, and the memorable proceedings ended. Parentheses, see Saltaire and its founder, page 68. End parentheses. But while Sir Titus was thus manifesting his warm attachment to the work people and his solicitude for their welfare, they, on the other hand, sought opportunity to express their gratitude to him by the presentation of his portrait. That portrait, painted by J. P. Knight, R. A., now hangs in the Institute, 
and represents him standing in an easy attitude by the side of a table on which he is leaning with his left hand. At the foot of the frame there is the following inscription. Presented to Sir Titus Salt, Baronet, of Crow Nest, by 2,295 subscribers, 1871. The presentation took place in the large hall of the Institute, in the presence of Sir Titus and Lady Salt, with the other members of the family. The following address was read on the occasion. To Sir Titus Salt, Baronet of Crow Nest and Saltaire, on presenting him with his portrait. Dear Sir Titus, it gives unfeigned pleasure to your employees and other inhabitants of Saltaire and neighborhood to be able to give effect to their long-cherished purpose to present you with a full-length portrait of yourself. The subscribers, however, are deeply sensible that no such testimonial is necessary to perpetuate your memory or enhance your fame. Your public spirit, commercial enterprise, deeds of charity, and great Christian benevolence have already erected to your honor, in many parts, monuments more lasting than marble tablets or granite pillars. And the noble institutions by which we are here surrounded, the splendid club and institute that will be graced by this portrait, the almshouses and infirmary, the baths and schools, the comfortable homes, the beautiful church, the park, will all proclaim to posterity, in language which cannot be mistaken, the true greatness and philanthropy of the noble founder of Saltaire. But while all this is true, we feel persuaded that this testimonial will occupy a place peculiarly its own. For when you, Sir Titus, shall have passed away, a time we trust far in the distance. This portrait will present to succeeding generations and keep ever before them, in so far as art can do so, the appearance of him whom so many delighted to honor, both as master and friend. We beg your acceptance, Sir Titus, of this testimonial as an expression of the esteem and regard of the subscribers. The spirit in which the proposal was first made, the liberal response it has received, and the thoroughness with which it has been carried out, cannot fail to be gratifying to your feelings. In the volume which accompanies this address, you will find the names of no less than 2,296 subscribers, and it is their earnest desire and prayer that you may be long spared to your family and the world and that when you are gathered to your fathers, this likeness may represent your features to generations yet unborn, and point to many lessons which may be learned from your interesting history. Signed on behalf of the subscribers. Saltair, August 16th, 1871. The screen was then drawn from the picture amid the cheers of the assembly. Sir Titus, who was very much affected, said, my dear friends, you need not expect any speech from me. I shall ever remember this day as the greatest of my life. This testimonial of your friendship and kindness I accept with the greatest gratitude, I assure you, and I hope it will find a place here to be viewed for generations yet to come as an emblem of your kindness. I may now congratulate you and myself on the completion of salt air. I have been twenty years at work, and now it is complete, and I hope it will be a satisfaction and a joy, and will minister to the happiness of all my people residing here. If I was eloquent or able to make a long speech, I should try to do so, but my feelings would not allow me. I thank you most cordially. A pleasing testimonial was also presented by the children of Saltaire, consisting of two silver-plated breakfast dishes. The reason for the selection of these articles was that they might be a memento daily before his eyes. The wishes of the subscribers were complied with, for their kind present has ever since been in daily use. Among many visitors attracted to Saltaire at this period from various parts of the world 
Two or three may be specially mentioned. The first was Lord Palmerston, when Premier, who included Saltaire in his visit to Bradford, when the foundation stone of the new exchange was laid. Sir Titus received his lordship and conducted him to the church, the schools, and the various departments of the mill, making use of the hoist as a means of transit from one story to another. On his arriving at the center of the weaving shed, the engines were stopped, and about two thousand of the hands had thus an opportunity of seeing him. After luncheon in the private dining room, his lordship left in the Scotch Express, which had been detained for him. The second illustrious visitors were the Burmese ambassadors, who were attired in their eastern official dress, and were conducted over the town and works by Mr. Titus Salt and Mr. Charles Steed. The third were the Japanese ambassadors, accompanied by a numerous suite. All these foreign visitors had been attracted to Saltaire by the fame of it that had gone forth, but such was their wonder at the vastness of the establishment and the completeness of the arrangements that it was evident that the half had not been told them. The hospitality shewn to these Oriental guests was marked by the thoughtful arrangements of the firm. The dining room was decorated for the occasion with a variety of plants, indigenous to the native country of the visitors, and instead of wine, to which they are unaccustomed, they were regaled with the choicest fruits. One of the metropolitan institutions, in which Sir Titus took much interest, was the Royal Albert Hall, Kensington. Towards its erection he very largely contributed, and he also purchased one of the largest and best boxes at the cost of one thousand pounds. Sir Titus was a frequent visitor to the hall when any special concert was given, not that he himself had much taste for music, but the brilliancy of the scene delighted him, and his own pleasure was much enhanced when he had friends around him to share it. Seldom was his box unoccupied, for when unable to be present himself, it was generously placed at the disposal of others. After the dignity of baronet was conferred upon him, he was presented at court, and went in in the attire of a deputy lieutenant. But after the ceremony his court address and sword were never assumed again. When in London he stayed at Thomas's hotel, where, on one occasion, he had a severe attack of illness. Happening to be in town, we visited him, and spent some time with him alone. On rising to leave, he said, let us have prayer before you go. On Sundays he generally attended Westminster Chapel, the Reverend Samuel Martins. Occasionally he went to Surrey Chapel, of which the Reverend Newman Hall was then the minister, and whose noble efforts in the erection of Christ Church received his liberal support. Once he worshipped at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and was much impressed with a sermon by the Reverend C. H. Spurgeon. But as his hearing had become impaired, it was a strain to listen to a discourse throughout, yet he eagerly watched the countenance of the preacher with manifest sympathy. During his autumnal visits to Scarborough, he was seldom absent from the services of South Cliff Church, both on weekdays and Sundays. Once only was he late, and then from no fault of his own. He joined heartily in the singing, and his attitude was ever that of profound reverence. Once a prayer meeting was held at the close of an evening service, at which he was unable to remain. On proceeding to his hotel afterwards, we found him with his Bible open before him, and as he closed it when we entered, he said, I could not remain at the prayer meeting, but I have remembered you here. From frequent attacks of gout, his walking powers became considerably impaired, so that a drive or a stroll on the esplanade was as much as his strength would allow. But there were many instances in his daily life there which are interesting to recall and which illustrate his character and disposition. It was a diversion to him to visit the fish market and there purchase the necessary supplies for the table. On one occasion he was accosted by a fishwoman and asked to buy a fine cod, but having forgotten his spectacles, he made this excuse for declining to purchase it. The woman, not willing to lose a good customer, offered to lend her own, which offer was readily accepted, and a bargain followed. 
but he forgot to return the borrowed spectacles and quietly walked away imagine the sequel the fishwoman hurrying after him and claiming her property which he was unconsciously carrying off on his nose another of his characteristics by the seaside was the interest he took in the children a certain confectioner's shop in the town was frequently visited and such good things as would please the young people were purchased in considerable quantities this he would not only send to those he knew but even the children of strangers had a share in his kindness he always remembered the fifth of november and regularly sent a donation to certain boys in whose pyrotechnic demonstrations he was particularly interested but perhaps his chief enjoyment at scarborough was the quiet evening spent with his family and a few intimate friends around him then he would freely join in conversation or take part in any social games that were introduced as the time for evening prayer approached the present writer was generally expected and when the usual hour arrived pastime was suspended or terminated for the evening and all gathered round the family altar in the autumn of eighteen seventy two an event occurred that affected not only his heart but still more so the heart of his eldest daughter who became engaged to henry wright esq j p of london miss salt had been for several years brought into closest intercourse with her father not only as his confidential secretary but by her loving ministrations in his times of sickness so that the prospect of losing her presence and valuable help seemed like parting with his right hand we question whether on any other occasion his character stands out more nobly than it did in this when he had satisfied himself that her suitor was in all respects worthy of the affections of his daughter he cordially welcomed him into the family and readily sacrificed all personal considerations that their happiness might be promoted when the time of their marriage approached he took a journey to london to visit her future home and to see that nothing was wanting for her comfort after an inspection of the interior arrangements he entered the dining-room to rest at that moment a favoured canary struck up a song as if in the secret of the visit turning towards the songster he playfully said well you seem to be saying what do you think of it all the marriage which was celebrated shortly after was the answer to the imaginary question the happy event took place at lightcliffe congregational church on the second of april eighteen seventy three when the rev thomas viney and the rev j thompson performed the ceremony an incident occurred in connection with it which revealed the heart of the father on an occasion so trying to himself to the question who giveth this woman sir titus replied i do with all my heart so the days of rejoicing and parting came and she who had been her father's helper went forth leaning on the arm of a husband to whom she was united not only by the bond of marriage but by another that even death cannot sever henceforth the visit to london by sir titus was invested with an interest it had not possessed before instead of sojourning at thomas's hotel there was a home at kensington to which two hearts were ever glad to bid him welcome and of whose hospitality he once facetiously remarked i prefer henry's hotel to any other under the guidance of his son-in-law he became acquainted with various localities of interest in the metropolis unknown to him before and of religious and benevolent institutions with whose names he had long been familiar and which had often been the recipients of his generous help among these was the memorial hall farringdon street in which he was much interested one sunday morning when unable to attend public worship he spent the time in reading the london city mission magazine which mrs wright had placed on the table the nature of the work carried on among the poor of the metropolis as therein described deeply affected him in the course of the day he said to mr wright holding up the magazine do you know anything about this work i should like to send a cheque for a hundred pounds to it to-morrow if you will take it for me 
A similar incident took place in the Paris exhibition of 1867, where Mr. Hawk had a stand for the distribution of the scriptures in various languages. Sir Titus was much interested in witnessing the eagerness of foreigners to possess a portion of God's word. He went up to the proprietor and said, I am just going to the hotel to pay my bill, and when it is settled I should like to give whatever money I have left over to this good work. He soon returned and handed fifty pounds to Mr. Hawk, although only a few months previously he had forwarded one hundred pounds for the same object. Perhaps no religious work in his own neighborhood enlisted his sympathies more than the Bradford Town Mission and the Bible Women. The latter movement was originated seventeen years ago by Miss Helen Taylor, well known for her benevolent exertions on behalf of the poor but her good work seemed, at one time, paralyzed for want of funds. Happening to meet Sir Titus, she told him of her dilemma. But as he had never heard of Bible women before, he begged her to come to his house and give him more information about them. As the best method of showing the nature of the work, she read to him a few extracts from the journal of one of the Bible women, known as Ruth. As he listened, tears were in his eyes, and at the close he said to Miss Taylor, That's a good work. Go on. I'll help you. And he was as good as his word, for not only did he pay all the expenses of the first year's domestic mission, but from first to last he manifested in various ways a peculiar interest in this simple, humble agency. He believed in the power of Christian sympathy, and rejoiced to hear from year to year of the increase of the messengers of mercy to the homes of sadness and sorrow. Once, every year, the Bible women were most heartily welcomed to Cronest and most hospitably entertained at his table, and those who have been present will never forget his thoughtful kindness on these occasions, making every arrangement for their enjoyment and doing everything in his power to make their visit a happy and refreshing one. He always sent his carriage to the station to meet them, and on their arrival, they were as warmly welcomed by him and family as if they had been the most distinguished visitors. He has frequently entertained at his table noble guests, but never did he look happier than when surrounded by his ten humble friends. When the day's pleasure was over, and his carriage was waiting at the door to take them to the station, he shook hands with each, giving them a large bouquet of flowers to cheer them in their own homes. Ruth was his special Bible woman. She was supported entirely by him and greatly valued for her faithful service. Almost the last money given by him was sent to her. Having heard that she had overworked herself and gone to the seaside for rest and change of air, he sent her a five-pound note to defray the expenses of her journey. There are many instances of his attachment to Christian ministers and his sympathy with them in their work. A fund having been opened for aged ministers, called the Pastor's Retiring Fund, he forwarded to the treasurer the sum of eighteen hundred pounds. It may truly be said that as the close of life drew nearer, he seemed more desirous to compress into it a greater amount of work for God and man. For he well knew that the night cometh when no man can work. Hence his liberality still more abounded as being the only way left by which he could work. He was determined that what property he had at his disposal should not be bequeathed, but given, not taken after death from his cold grasp, but that his own heart and hand, stirred with the warmth of life and love, should present it while living. One of his latest benefactions was the promise of eleven thousand pounds to provide two scholarships for boys of one hundred twenty pounds each at the Bradford Grammar School and two of one hundred pounds each available for girls. Having long held the opinion that the support of religion should be entirely voluntary, that the patronage and control of the state militated against its spiritual power, that for any particular church to be established by law was equivalent to a monopoly which was unjust in itself and inimical to religious liberty, 
that the appointment of bishops by a political minister and their sitting in parliament were foreign to the genius of christianity he was therefore heartily in favor of every legitimate means to bring the union between church and state to an end he had helped in his day to abolish monopoly in trade he had lived to see a mighty impulse given to the commercial life of the country when trade was left to itself and he confidently believed that were the church of england also free it would give new impulse to her usefulness and to the spiritual life of the nation it was therefore not merely on religious grounds but as a man of business that he supported the liberation society and latterly gave to it the sum of five thousand pounds we have had ample evidence of his sympathy with seafaring men another instance may be mentioned hearing of disastrous shipwrecks on the east coast he offered a lifeboat but as each station was at that time supplied it was sent to stornoway where it is still in use and known as the salt air lifeboat during the last few years of his life he was unable from physical infirmities to take that prominent part in local politics to which he had been accustomed yet his attachment to his former principles never wavered the liberal party ever regarded him as a tower of strength when those principles had to be vindicated in eighteen sixty nine a vacancy occurred in the representation of the borough by the decision of baron martin touching one of the recently elected members the election that ensued found sir titus at his post he was chairman of mr mail's committee and the triumphant return of that gentleman to parliament was to him a matter of great satisfaction from the similarity of their views on ecclesiastical questions at the general election in eighteen seventy four his physical strength was so much impaired that all public excitement had to be avoided but he watched the issue of it with intense interest his old political friend mr forster seemed to him by his great education bill to be putting fresh facilities into the hands of the state church clergy for controlling popular education this opinion was shared by a large portion of the liberal party in bradford and throughout the country generally and produced a spirit of antagonism among political friends who had hitherto acted in concert it also evoked strenuous opposition to the return of mr forster and mr ripley whose views on this question were considered identical notwithstanding the opposition both these gentlemen were successful we refer to these incidents as illustrative of the character of sir titus whatever were his principles in politics or religion he stood up for them at any personal sacrifice but when the strife was over he was too generous to cherish other than feelings of respect for those who contentiously differed from him his large subscriptions and donations to public charities placed in his hands a considerable amount of patronage in the way of voting at the election of applicants for admission into the hull orphanage or the lancaster idiot asylum his interest in any particular case generally secured its election in view of the occasion he was frequently inundated with letters but the applications that received his sympathy and help were the most deserving whom he selected after careful deliberation as a liberal subscriber to the british workman he received four hundred copies monthly of that publication which were sent to the Bradford Town Mission for distribution. From the Tract Society, he received a large monthly supply of tracts, which willing hands circulated for him. As for books and pamphlets, the variety and number which he gave away were remarkable. For when he invested in literature, it was not on the scale of ordinary purchasers, but with a liberality that testified his gratitude to the authors and his desire to benefit others by the promulgation of their opinions thus the evening of his life was spent in doing good and by his deeds we know his life he liveth long who liveth well all other life is thrown away he liveth longest who can tell of true deeds truly done each day End of chapter 17
Chapter 18 of Sir Titus Salt, Baronet, His Life and Its Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. Sir Titus Salt, Baronet, His Life and Its Lessons by Robert Belgarney. Chapter 18. How wise a short retreat to steal, The vanity of life to feel, And from its cares to fly, To act one calm domestic scene, Earth's bustle and the grave between, Retire and learn to die. Hannah Moore In this chapter, three events in the life of Sir Titus Salt will be noticed as perhaps the most important of his closing years. These were the celebration of his seventieth birthday, the erection of his statue, and the opening of the new Sunday schools at Saltair. The birthday anniversary had often been celebrated in the bosom of his family, but on this occasion he had a desire once more to gather his workpeople around him that they might share his joy and partake of his hospitality. Such a desire seemed all the more natural, inasmuch as this period was also the twentieth anniversary of the opening of Salt Air. Festivities had frequently been held since the memorable banquet of 1853. Numerous gala days and excursions had been given to the workpeople, amongst which was one to the Manchester Art Treasure Exhibition. But the one that took place on the 20th of September, 1873, far exceeded in magnitude that of 1856, and was emphatically the climax of all. The number of guests on this occasion amounted to 4,200, three special trains being chartered to convey them from Saltaire to Cronest. It was in the higher part of the grounds that the fete was held. Three bands of music occupied the stands around which crowds were gathered, but there were other attractions provided. A portion of the park was set apart for the well-known exhibition of Punch and Judy, which, though intended for children, drew around it others of a larger growth. Another enclosure was devoted to athletic sports, which consisted of high jump, hurdle, and sack races, etc., all kinds of gala games were indulged in, and now and then an extemporized dancing party was got up, so provokingly merry was the music. There were present managers, clerks, weavers, wool sorters, spinners, engine tenters, and messengers. But they all had such a respectable appearance, it was impossible to say to what particular occupation any one belonged. At two o'clock dinner took place in an immense tent formed in the shape of the letter T, like the works of Saltair, and which covered forty-two hundred square yards. The tables were eleven hundred eighty-eight yards in length, and the sitting accommodation double that length, or nearly a mile and a half. Joints of beef, weighing in all twenty-six hundred pounds, were placed at equal distances the intervening spaces being filled with cakes and fruit in rich profusion, while tea urns and crockery were there in sufficient quantities to stock a dozen ordinary shops. Sir Titus and his family took their seats at the central table, and the whole assembly rose at the preconcerted sound of a bugle and sang grace with a fervor which was thrilling. When the meal was concluded, one of the workmen stood up and said they were celebrating two most important events, one being the twentieth anniversary of the opening salt air. When it was commenced, it was thought that works of such magnitude went beyond all bounds of prudence and moderation. From the commencement to the present time, salt air had gradually increased, and now it was one of the most complete industrial establishments in the world. There was only one salt air. The other event was the seventieth anniversary of their worthy employer, Sir Titus Salt, Baronet. In the name of your employees, then, addressing Sir Titus, 
I wish you may be long spared to live among us, and that you may see the return of this day many and many times. On behalf of your work people, let me return you their most sincere thanks for the kind, hospitable, and courteous manner in which you have entertained us this day. An eyewitness thus describes the sequel. When royalty and loyalty occasionally meet together in the street of large cities, there may be something in the way of cheering that will correspond in loudness with the cheering of those work people. But for downright heartiness, commend us before all to such manifestations as those which startled the birds at Crow Nest on this occasion. Well might the united bands at this moment chime in with the feelings of the people and play the fine old English gentleman. Only instead of thinking of the founder of the feast of the olden time, as the song has it, they were enabled to claim him as essentially of the present time. Struggling to control the emotion so natural at such a moment, Sir Titus replied, I am exceedingly glad to see all my work people here today. I like to see you about me and to look upon your pleasant and cheerful faces. I hope you will all enjoy yourselves this day, and all get safely home again without accident after your day's pleasure. I hope to see you many times yet, if I am spared, and I wish health, happiness, and prosperity to you all. If I am spared... The infirmities of age were then coming upon him, and though the warmth of his heart was as strong as ever, he knew that it did not become him to speak confidently of the coming years. My birthday! What a different sound that word had in my youthful ears! And now each time the day comes round, less and less white its mark appears. The second event of this period was the erection in Bradford of a public statue. It was the custom of the ancients not to sacrifice to the gods until after sunset, and it has not been the custom to erect statues to men until their sun has set. But to this there are in our day a few well-known exceptions, and chiefly of men renowned for their military achievements. It was as a great captain of industry, a leader in commercial enterprise, a distinguished citizen and a benefactor of his fellow men, that this honor was paid to Sir Titus Salt during his lifetime. The project was conceived two or three years before it was brought to consummation, and the shape it took from the first rendered perfect concealment from him who it was thus intended to honor almost impossible. A circular, headed The Salt Statue, had been sent to all his friends, which, at last, came under his own notice. He read it attentively, and then, returning it, quietly added, So they wish to make me into a pillar of salt. But before the committee could proceed further, it was necessary to communicate their intention to Sir Titus himself and a personal interview with him was solicited. That interview will never be forgotten by those who were present. Great as their admiration for him had hitherto been, they felt they had only begun to learn his true worth. His modesty and genuineness were so transparent that they felt constrained to exert themselves all the more to give effect to their wishes. But we prefer to give the words of the chairman, Mr. Vickerman, in reference to that interview. One of our number was deputed to introduce the subject, and was instructed to let it be clearly understood that our purpose was taken, and that the intention would be proceeded with. Sir Titus, while displaying considerable emotion, resolutely refused to sanction the movement and pleaded most earnestly that we would abandon our plan. We assured him that we had taken our resolution, and were well aware that to erect a statue during the lifetime of a man was somewhat unprecedented, but that we had the feeling 
that it was not without its disadvantages to the people generally when men of sterling worth and principle were first allowed to pass away without any recognition by those whose interest and welfare they had been associated. Our efforts to induce Sir Titus to sanction the movement were, however, altogether useless. And when at length we said that our resolution was determinedly fixed, he then implored us to permit him to die before our plans were made known. To this request we felt constrained to offer what resistance was possible, and ultimately Sir Titus, at our urgent request, engaged to remain quiet and not publicly announce that the movement had not his sympathy. The sculptor selected for the work was Mr. John Adams Acton, who, on receiving the commission, proceeded to Carrera in order to obtain a piece of marble, similar in quality to that out of which he had previously carved the statue of Mr. Gladstone in his robes as Chancellor of the Exchequer. The block secured weighed fourteen tons, and required sixteen horses to convey it from the wharf to the studio. After many sittings given by Sir Titus to the artist, there came forth from his hand the colossal statue now standing in front of the town hall. It represents him in a characteristic attitude, the right arm resting on the chair in which he is sitting, and holding in his left a scroll, on which some lines are drawn representing the plans of salt air. The features of Sir Titus were well brought out, the largeness of his forehead and amplitude of beard giving force and dignity to the countenance. The canopy was designed by Messrs. Lockwood and Mawson, and is not only in harmony with the character of the statue, but with the architecture of the town hall, in which it appears a suitable adjunct. The base of the canopy is seventeen feet square, and upon it rests the base of the statue five feet high. From the four corners of the base rise grouped shafts of granite supporting the arches. Over each of the shafts is a crocketed pinnacle with angular shafts. The canopy itself is composed of four large stones, which form a groined roof with molded ribs and a large pendant cross in the center. The arches contain statuettes, each with its symbol representing justice, prudence, temperance, and charity. The whole is surmounted by a spire forty feet high. The canopy is enclosed behind the tracery work, the other three sides being open. The cost of the statue, canopy, etc., was about three thousand pounds, which was raised by subscriptions varying from the child's penny to the maximum five pounds. The unveiling of the statue took place on the 3rd of August, 1874, which was a red-letter day in Bradford, being kept as a general holiday throughout the borough. In the procession from the railway station to the statue were His Grace the Duke of Devonshire, attended on one side by the Mayor of Bradford and the other by the Lord Mayor of York, preceded by the Salt Air Band. Then followed members of Parliament, mayors of neighboring towns, ex-mayors of Bradford, the Town Council, private friends, etc. Those parts of the speeches delivered on the occasion and bearing on the subject before us, we briefly present to the reader. The Chairman of the Committee said, they were met to do honor to one of Bradford's worthiest citizens, and to proclaim that, in the midst of their intensely busy life, which was apt to generate selfishness, they could admire those in their midst whose career had been a long one of unsullied honor, whose wealth had been spent in high and worthy objects, whose modesty of disposition and strength of character are worthy of imitation by the rising businessmen of the town and whose faithfulness to the principles which have guided them have been most unswerving. It was to witness the unveiling of the statue of a man preeminently distinguished in these respects that they were now assembled. After giving an account of the rise and progress of the movement, the Duke of Devonshire was requested to unveil the statue. His Grace, having withdrawn the covering, said, he had gladly undertaken to unveil the statue of their distinguished fellow-townsman. 
distinguished by his enterprise as a manufacturer, and more distinguished by his enlightened regard and solicitude for the welfare of those employed by him. But he could not now consider that the noble example of Sir Titus Salt was a matter that concerned Bradford only, or even Yorkshire only. It was a matter of national and general interest. Englishmen were sometimes spoken of, as if they were so immersed in matters of business, or so engrossed in the pursuit of wealth, as to be insensible in a great degree to claims of a higher and nobler kind. But such an assertion was a great calumny against the national character. Very much had been done, both by public and private enterprise, to elevate the moral and physical conditions of the entire community. But it would be impossible to name any more remarkable instance of plans wisely and systematically devised and successfully and energetically carried into execution for the well-being, the happiness, and the moral advancement of the population than was to be found in what may be truly called the model town of Salt Air. They would not find there any dark or noisome alleys, or any of those abominations that disgrace the civilization of the present century. As for the factory, its construction was very different from other buildings of that description. It afforded a most favorable example, of which could be done in the way of combining architectural grace with purposes of utility. Beauty is, in itself, and in its indirect consequences, to be preferred to ugliness. And a debt of gratitude was due to those who gave an example of the former, rather than of the latter. The people of Saltair have had ample provision made for their comfort and well-being in their dwellings, gardens, baths and wash-houses, park, almshouses, infirmary schools, and institute. He would congratulate the people of Bradford on having shewn in so marked a way their appreciation for the great services of Sir Titus Salt. They had taken the best means in their power to guard against the possibility of those great services being hereafter forgotten by erecting a statue in his honor. No doubt there were other forms of memorial which have their recommendation, but after all it appeared to him that this which is the oldest is the most proper form in which distinguished and eminent men and the good they have done in their day and generation can be handed down to posterity. Mr. Morley, M.P., said, It might be asked why he, connected all his life with London, and having no direct communication with Bradford, should be present on this occasion. But he represented this feeling, that the honor they were doing that day to Sir Titus Salt was shared by thousands of persons not connected with the town. During the last forty years, in all those great conflicts during which great principles had been established, which had promoted liberty of person, liberty of opinion, greater domestic comfort, in all these undertakings there was not a man in England who had taken a more earnest, more conscientious, or more liberal part than Sir Titus Salt. He was here to thank him for the stimulus of a noble example, and to express his thankfulness for this, that there is not a home in Great Britain that is not happier, more pure, with more comforts in it, owing to the continuous and earnest efforts made by enlightened and earnest men, among whom Sir Titus Salt had always held a prominent position. There had never been an object presented to him that could tell in any way upon the well-being either of his neighbors or fellow countrymen, which had not found in him a readiness to give either personal service or pecuniary help to the fullest extents required. And therefore he was entitled to the fullest expression of public gratitude, and their desire was, even while he is living, to show him that they were not unmindful of the services he had bestowed. In this money-loving and wealth-acquiring age, it was refreshing to find a man possessed of means and glad of opportunities, almost thinking it a favor when opportunities were put before him, for dispensing the wealth which in so large a measure God had given him, as a result of his own intelligent efforts. He might add that, 
as by conviction and an obedience to conscience sir titus salt was a nonconformist he had never confined his princely liberality within the narrow limits of a mere sect but had been ready with a liberality of spirit which had always done him honour to promote the erection of churches and schools and the promotion of any organization whatever which by god's blessing might tell upon the material social and above all the religious well-being of a people among whom he has lived there were thousands now before him each one of whom might take a lesson from the life of this distinguished man they might depend upon it that when the history of england came to be written a very substantial chapter would be given to the class of men of whom sir titus salt was a distinguished ornament and who by personal sympathy and continuous earnest effort have contributed so largely to the good work that has been done during the last forty years there was need when such men were advancing in years or passing away for an accession of fresh men to come forward to carry on the work that had been so nobly begun he commended with all his heart the example of sir titus salt's life to the imitation of every inhabitant of the town lord f cavendish m p said if they looked around in that prosperous town and asked who were the men who had made it so prosperous the answer would be that to none was it more due than to sir titus salt who had first introduced the great trade of alpaca they honored the man who had founded a community which he ventured to say was unequaled not only in england but throughout the world and whose influence was felt wherever great industrial enterprises existed he believed that nothing had been more marked in recent history than the increased care and solicitude for the welfare of the employed which had been shown by the great employers and one potent cause of this had been the example of men like sir titus salt he could but hope that when that noble sight close to the exchange and town hall was thronged as it was every market day by busy merchants and manufacturers they as they passed by the statue would remember the example to be learnt from sir titus salt and would see that their own welfare and good name would be best obtained by following that example which he had so nobly set mr john crosley m p said it had been his privilege for many years to be intimately acquainted with sir titus salt and the more he had known him the more he had esteemed his high character mr ripley m p said he had watched the way in which sir titus salt had conducted first a small business and then a large one advancing from one thing to another until his name became almost of world-wide renown and all this had been done by straightforward honesty probity and perseverance these qualities had been an example to many a man standing before him to persevere in the midst of difficulties his wealth had been freely used and distributed to promote the comforts and relieve the wants of many thousands of homes a gala in Peel Park followed, which was attended by several thousands of people. The whole was concluded by a display of fireworks, the finest that had ever been seen in Bradford, the finale consisting of a piece of illuminated workmanship showing the words, Bradford's gratitude to Sir Titus Salt. Such is an epitome of the events of that memorable day and surely Bradford, in thus honoring her most distinguished townsman, did honor to herself. As for him to whom this high mark of respect was paid, and concerning whom these eulogisms were spoken, he was at the time quietly pursuing his wanted advocation at Crow Nest, undisturbed by the exciting scenes then transpiring in Bradford. To him the event could not be otherwise than gratifying. But we doubt not that a shadow sometimes crossed his mind when he remembered that his life work was well nigh ended, and the time drawing near when he should return no more to his house 
neither should his place know him any more. In commemoration of the event, a medal was struck, on which was represented the statue, thousands of which were bought by the general public, to be preserved as a memento of him whom the community delighted to honor. The erection of the Sunday schools at Salt Hare was the last great undertaking of Sir Titus Salt's life. As we have seen in a former chapter, he had been, in his younger days, a Sunday school teacher, and ever since his interest in this department of Christian effort was unabated. The Sunday school anniversary at Salt Hare usually brought him from Cronest, and in the afternoon service for the scholars he took special delight. On one of these occasions he came from Scarborough, and, though at the time suffering acutely from gout, he would not be persuaded to stay away. It had been represented to him that the premises occupied by the Sunday scholars were inconvenient. He therefore resolved to supply the deficiency. Well he knew from experience the great importance of commodious schoolrooms, and how much the voluntary service of teachers had a claim on the sympathy and cooperation of Christian men. It is possible also that, believing secular education was the more immediate duty of the state, and religious instruction that of the church, he was anxious that the church at Saltaire should have all needful appliances for the spiritual training of the young. In the erection of these schools, Mr. Titus Salt took a leading part, and it afforded the father no small joy to see not only his son, but his grandsons, associated in this good work. The cornerstones were laid on the 1st of May, 1875, by Gordon and Harold Salt, who were presented on the occasion with silver trowels and mallets. Sir Charles Reed, chairman of the London School Board, presided. The schools stand upon a portion of the allotment gardens near the works, having a frontage of 75 feet to Victoria Road and a considerable depth to Caroline Street. The principal front is of chaste character, and contains two entrances, for boys and girls respectively, with eight circular-headed windows, surmounted by a handsome cornice. On the ground floor there is an assembly hall, eighty-five feet by forty feet, from which open ten classrooms, five on each side, with a vestry and lecture room in the rear. Running round the assembly hall is a large gallery, from which open twelve other classrooms, five on each side, as on the ground floor, and two of larger size, above the lecture room. As the scholars assemble, they proceed to their places, either on the ground floor or the gallery, and in this collective position they join in the opening and closing services. Accommodation is made for eight hundred scholars. It will thus be seen that the leading idea in the arrangement is that the teaching shall be carried on in separate rooms, not in one large building as in most Sunday schools. The library is placed between the two front entrances, and can thus be reached without disturbing the teachers in their duties. Each classroom is furnished with a small table and chair for the teacher, and the entire suite is carpeted with Brussels carpet, which is provided by a special fund originated by the teachers. In fact, no expense has been spared to render these premises as complete as possible, and they may be justly regarded the model Sunday schools of the country. Suspended over the Eastern Gallery is a life-size portrait of Sir Titus Salt, which was publicly presented by the teachers at the opening ceremony. A magnificent organ harmonium was also presented by Mr. George Salt. The entire cost of the structure exclusive of sight was about ten thousand pounds. The opening ceremony took place on the 30th of May, 1876, in the presence of Sir Titus, Lady Salt and family, Mr. and Mrs. Wright, Mr. John Cosley, M.P., Mr. E. Crosley, Mayor of Halifax, Mr. Henry Lee of Manchester, President of the Sunday School Union, Alderman Law, etc. Mr. Titus Salt said, it was exactly twelve months since the memorial stones of that building were laid. He was almost tired of hearing about the completion of Salt Air. Six years ago, that consummation was supposed to have been reached, and still it was unfinished. Since that time, however, there had been an educational revolution. School boards were extending, 
and the general inclination of elementary education was towards what was the proper condition of things, namely, under the control of the ratepayers. At Saltaire they had handed over their day schools to the school board, but while this was so, it became all the more incumbent upon them to see to the religious instruction of the young, and therefore his father had erected that building, which he thought would be second to none in the kingdom for its own special purpose. He hoped and believed that the intention of his father in the erection of that edifice would be fully realized. Sir Titus Salt was present, and at his request, his grandchild, Harold Crosley Salt, declared the building open amid several rounds of cheering. This was the last public ceremony at which Sir Titus was present. Indeed, the enfeebled state of his health prevented him remaining until the close of the proceedings. Thus his work at Saltair was finished, and as he retired from the scene in which his children and grandchildren had taken a prominent part, it seemed almost the fulfillment of a scripture promise. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. End of chapter 18。Chapter 19 of Sir Titus Salt, Baronet, His Life and Its Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. Sir Titus Salt, Baronet, His Life and Its Lessons, by Robert Belgarne, Chapter 19. The death of those distinguished by their station, but by their virtues more, awakes the mind to solemn dread, and strikes a saddening awe. Not that we grieve for them, but for ourselves, left to the toil of life. Thompson. From the beginning of 1876, the health of Sir Titus perceptibly declined. Each attack of illness left him less able to cope with the one that succeeded. Walking exercise became irksome, and was now chiefly confined to the library or garden terrace. Yet occasionally, when he felt a little stronger, he would set out for salt air, where an hour or two was quietly spent after which he returned home, wearied with the effort. How familiar to the people of Bradford was his well-known figure, clad in the characteristic attire, which for many years had consisted of trousers of scotch plaid, waistcoat of the same material with gilt buttons, a frock-coat of black cloth. They might still have recognized in him the same remarkably intelligent eye as of old, the calm demeanour, and the somewhat cold exterior which so often misinterpreted the warmth within. All these features were much the same, but, alas, his bent frame, silvery locks, feeble gait, with hand leaning heavily on a staff, were unmistakable signs that his earthly pilgrimage was drawing to a close. The respect and reverence paid to him in the streets was very remarkable. It was as though the father of the community was passing by. What rendered this circumstance more worthy of notice was that he to whom this homage was thus silently paid seemed perfectly unconscious of it. Perhaps the language of Job, with some allowance for its oriental imagery, might appropriately have been put into those lips now sealed in death. When I went out to the gate through the city, when I prepared my seat in the street, the young men saw me and hid themselves, and the aged rose and stood up. The princes refrained talking and laid their hand on their mouth. Unto me they gave ear and waited, and kept silence at my counsel. And they waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouth as for the latter rain. The days at Crow Nest were sometimes to him rather monotonous, with his mind still active and alive to all that was transpiring in the busy world, 
no wonder that he felt the restraints which his bodily infirmities imposed. The spirit indeed was willing, but the flesh was weak. Still the numerous letters he received furnished him, during the forenoon, with congenial occupation, in answering which he was assisted by his second daughter. The generosity that had hitherto been so remarkable in him was not in any way diminished. Some men in old age have become hard, grasping, and penurious even, when in possession of plenty. It was the opposite with Sir Titus Salt. At the close of life, his hand was more bountiful than ever, and his heart more enlarged. Nor was this because his mental faculties were weakened, no, but because the light of an eternal world had fallen upon his spirit, and his sense of responsibility was quickened. He felt that his day was closing, and he must needs work in the lingering light of the setting sun. The last considerable act of generosity, of which we are cognizant, was in the month of April. The annual session of the Yorkshire Congregational Union was then being held in Halifax. A fund was there commenced for the extinction of debts on village churches. When Sir Titus was informed of the scheme, he immediately said, I should like to help it. And, taking out his notebook, he wrote the name of the society, and, opposite to it, six hundred pounds. Many such promises, payable in two or three years, were recorded, amounting to many thousands of pounds, but which he did not live to fulfill. After his decease it was found that no provision had been made in his will to meet such promises, but the family have generously taken the responsibility upon themselves. During this time of enforced seclusion, his heart was often cheered by the receipt of various letters expressive of gratitude from persons whom he had helped in time of need. These letters he highly prized, and many that have come to hand since he passed away would still more have gladdened him. One writer says, For the last fourteen years I had in Sir Titus Salt the best of earthly friends, a friend through whose generous aid I have been enabled to educate myself and to gain the position I now hold in connection with the public press. It was once my lot to beg my bread as a starving village lad. But Sir Titus Salt, becoming aware of my anxiety to raise myself in the social scale, took the liveliest interest in my progress, and, by God's help, never let go my hand, but was ever ready to help me on my journey." In the advancement of the sons of widows, of young men studying for the Christian ministry, or starting in business, he always took a deep interest. Many were the letters that came from such during his life and after his decease. A minister thus wrote, He is blessed by thousands, and not the least by students and ministers who he has helped. I am not the only one from Airedale College who is thankful for the help he rendered and the kind way in which it was done. Yet it was all the while painfully evident that his physical infirmities were increasing, and the sands and the glass were running out, the more rapidly because they were fewer. In the month of April he went with Lady Salt and his daughters to Harrogate for change of air, which was the means of reviving him for a while. Indeed, so much was he invigorated by it that he was able, in the following month, to pay a visit to his eldest son at Mapewell in Leicestershire. Thence he proceeded to London to spend a few weeks with Mr. and Mrs. Wright. It was to them a cause of rejoicing to have the domestic circle of Crow Nest once more transferred to Kensington. Yet this joy was overcast by the feeble appearance of Sir Titus, and especially with his loss of appetite. No wonder, then, that in the midst of their social gathering, fears were awakened, if not expressed, that perhaps this might be his last visit to them. That there were grave reasons for this foreboding soon became evident by symptoms of irregular action of the heart and the recurrence of fainting attacks to which he had recently been subject. He had always been adverse to medical treatment, except by his own rules, but in deference to the wishes of the family, an eminent physician was consulted. 
the opinion then given was so unfavorable that the journey home was undertaken with much solicitude let us return with him to his yorkshire home to see how the few remaining months are passed and watch the lamp of life as it burns in the socket throughout the whole of those months he was more or less an invalid though it was not always easy for him to be treated as such once he ventured with his family to church but the effort was so exhausting that henceforth there was no more worship for him in the earthly sanctuary the church was now to be in the house there he had frequent communion with god alone or when his pastor visited him and the family were gathered a short devotional service was sometimes held it was our privilege also occasionally to see him during those trying months and to speak words of comfort in his ear the memory of those visits is precious and though almost sacred we would recall a few incidents connected with them which indicate the state of his mind in the prospect of death one evening when the hour of family prayer arrived we gave him an arm to the dining-room and when expressing a hope that he was a little stronger he pointed to his shrunken frame and said you see i am only now a bag of bones his chair was so placed in the room that he might hear every word that was read sometimes with his inverted hand behind his ear his whole countenance evinced intense earnestness the ejaculatory utterances of his heart were often audible and his emphatic amen at the close of the prayer left the impression that he had himself been speaking with god on another occasion we asked him if his faith in jesus christ were firm his hopes clear and prospects bright no he said not so much as i should like them to be but all my trust is in him he is the only foundation on which i rest nothing else nothing else we encouraged him by saying that his salvation was not dependent upon his feelings that with his depressing physical weakness these might fluctuate and change but jesus christ the same yesterday and today and for ever that is what i want to realize he said the answer given was cling simply to the cross and leave health life soul all in the saviour's hand and this will yield perfect peace on which he said with much calmness i can do no more but leave myself there we then repeated the well-known soliloquy of roland hill shortly before his death and when i'm to die receive me i'll cry for jesus has loved me <laughs> i cannot tell why but this i do find we two are so joined he'll not be in glory and leave me behind with these lines he was greatly comforted and cheered are they in print he said where can i find them if ever mortal man had merited heaven by good works it was sir titus salt but no he never referred to anything he had done or made it a ground of boasting in the presence of god and in the prospect of eternity he appeared as a man stripped of all self-righteousness and clothed with the righteousness of christ as his only raiment some might regard this as a sign of failing nature nay it was rather the evidence of grace abounding and when we contrast this humility and self-abasement with the position he had occupied which was like that of a king among men the words of another king seem appropriate i have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother my soul is even as a weaned child but while these spiritual fruits were comforting to those who discerned them the symptoms of increasing bodily weakness were painfully evident to all his nights were often sleepless and as he tossed to and fro longing for the dawn he would sometimes sink into a brief slumber for a while he was unable to leave his bed till noon but one morning when we were there he made an effort to be up early 
it was a matter of surprise that he should wish to rise so soon but the reason was at once apparent it was to be present at family worship which now seemed to be his chief pleasure as he was unable to walk upstairs he was carried in an invalid's chair by two men servants but even in this his characteristic punctuality was manifest when the hour of retiring had struck the order was given to his attendants and having said good night to his family circle he was borne away waving his hand as he disappeared into the hall and up the staircase to his bedchamber the remark was once made by a member of the family that no express train could have been started with more regularity and precision than were observed on these occasions during the day when the sun was bright he was occasionally drawn along the garden terrace in a spring carriage by his beloved daughters with his devoted wife always by his side but here too another habit would unconsciously assert itself namely that of commander-in-chief for even the control of the vehicle the spots to be visited the time to return were never entrusted to others but kept under his supreme command the month of october was the usual time for the family to visit scarborough but owing to the state of the invalid's health little reference had been made to the subject what was our surprise one day when he seriously said can you find room for us this year at scarborough at first the proposal was considered by his family as fanciful but when it appeared as a fixed purpose his regular medical attendant mr charteris unwilling to take upon himself the responsibility of such a journey took the opinion of his former medical adviser and friend mr scattergood of leeds their united consent was given to the proposal in support of this there were two reasons one being that the sea air might probably give an impetus to the patient's rallying force the other was that the change was absolutely necessary for lady salt whose long and unwearied vigils had well nigh exhausted her strength and thus it came to pass that sir titus even in his enfeebled condition once more visited his favorite watering-place for many years we had welcomed him on his arrival at the station but never before in such affecting circumstances as the present what a change the strong man had become weak as a child so that a carriage had to be drawn up close to the train to receive him in taking this journey his medical attendant accompanied him which circumstance together with other particulars connected with his health were recorded in the daily press but such was his dislike to read bulletins about himself that in deference to his wishes the reporters abstained from sending them the change of scene in air scarborough had for a while a beneficial influence and as his appetite improved his spirits revived and when he could be drawn into the sunshine on the esplanade a faint hope was awakened that his life might yet be prolonged indeed his local medical adviser at first encouraged that hope for there was no sign of organic disease but only of physical exhaustion alas the hope was only temporary what human skill could keep the wheels in motion that had revolved so long what change of temperature or locality could renovate the frame that had borne such a strain and was now worn out one night a terrible storm raged which violently shook the windows of his apartment and greatly alarmed the invalid the cold also chilled him so that the little strength he had previously gained was soon lost then returned those fainting attacks which again caused great anxiety and indicated to all that a return home was now most desirable yet in the midst of all these anxieties his mind was calm and his heart kind he still thought how he might do good unable to attend church on dispensary sunday he sent five pounds to the collection too weak to visit in person the cottage hospital he forwarded one hundred pounds to its funds thus closed his last visit to scarborough when he left the station many friends stood at a distance to witness his departure knowing full well that they 
should see his face no more. The arrangements made by the station master for the comfort of the invalid on his homeward journey were gratefully appreciated. But when he entered Cronest, he never again crossed its threshold. He had returned to die, and to exchange his earthly abode for an house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It was well for him that he had nothing to do but to die. As a man of business, he had long before set his house in order, so that no earthly thoughts distracted his mind now. He had no arrears of duties to wipe off. These had received his attention at the right time. He had committed the keeping of his soul to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And now he calmly waited to be gathered to his rest. The season of Christmas was approaching when the family circle was wont to assemble under the parental roof. But this year how different. On Sunday, the 17th December, 1876, Sir Titus became much worse, and the telegraph summoned his absent children to come at once. It was a long Sabbath day's journey to some of them, but one by one they arrived. And what does not often happen in a large family, none were absent when their father was dying. Yet still he lingered by the margin of the river. We were privileged to see him there. But the stream was not dark or cold, as some have pictured it, and he seemed just waiting for the signal to pass over. We repeated the line so oft whispered in the ear of the dying, Hide me, O oh my Saviour, hide, till the storm of life be past. Safe into the haven guide, O oh, receive my soul at last. With his hands clasped in prayer, he said with emphasis, How kind he is to me. And so we left him to meet no more on earth. Still he lingered. Sometimes, when unconscious, his thoughts seemed to be running back to early days and to the companions of his boyhood. A brief note from Cronest, dated 24th December, says, He is still with us, and it may be hours before he joins the host above. Nothing can be taken but the smallest quantities of water. Consciousness remains, weakness increases, but no pain. The earth here wears a white mantle. Snow is about four inches deep. A holy calm now reigns within and without. Yet the lagging wheels of nature were slowly moving. The spark of life was flickering in the socket, and loved ones kept fanning it and watching lest any rude blast should hasten its extinction. But on Friday afternoon, the 29th December, 1876, at twenty minutes to one o'clock, he passed away. When all was over, a note written by a member of the family contained the following. He has gone away from the land of the dying to that of the living. I quoted to him again and again, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I give unto them eternal life. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hands. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It was my lot to be almost constantly with him during his last days. I was with him to the last, and when the end had come, I could not help touching his hand and saying, Farewell, happy spirit with the joyous belief that we shall meet again. Happily, for those who remain, there was no physical suffering, and his breath died away like a soft summer breeze. How blessed the righteous when he dies, when sinks a weary soul to rest, how mildly beam the closing eyes, how gently heaves the expiring breast. So fades a summer cloud away, so sinks the gale when storms are o'er, so gently shuts the eye of day, so dies a wave along the shore. Life's labor done, as sinks the clay, light from its load the spirit flies, 
while heaven and earth combine to say how blessed the righteous when he dies. End of chapter 19Chapter 20 of Sir Titus Salt, Baronet, His Life and Its Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sir Titus Salt, Baronet, His Life and Its Lessons by Robert Balgarni. Chapter 20 Go to the Grave, Though Like a Fallen Tree at once with verdure, flowers and fruitage crowned. Thy form may perish in thine honours lie, lost in the mouldering bosom of the ground. Go to the grave, for there thy Saviour lay in death's embraces, ere he rose on high, and all the ransomed by that narrow way pass to the eternal life beyond the sky. Montgomery. The death of Sir Titus Salt was soon flashed throughout the kingdom, and produced deep regret among all ranks and classes. This was strikingly exhibited in various articles that appeared in the daily press, from the London Times to the remotest provincial newspaper. There was hardly one that did not announce his death, and give a brief outline of his marvelous career. As for the town of Bradford, the mournful event cast over it a dark shadow, for the inhabitants felt that upon them especially the stroke fell heavily, since their foremost citizen and greatest benefactor was now no more. The great bell of the town hall, tolling at intervals, was the voice that expressed the sorrow of the community. But this was not all. When the news became known that Sir Titus Salt was dead, the mayor received communications from all quarters, suggesting that a public funeral was due to him who was gone. True, they had conferred upon him in life all the honors within their power, but now they would add one tribute more to his worth. His worship at once addressed a letter of condolence to Lady Salt by the hands of the town clerk, who at the same time conveyed an official request that the family would kindly permit the public to show their respect for the deceased in the way that their feelings prompted. It would, no doubt, have been more congenial to the wishes of the family had all outward pomp been avoided, and that they could have carried their dead to the sepulchre in the way other mourners have done. But in deference to the general wish, the arrangement, so far as the passing of the cortege through Bradford was concerned, were left in the hands of the mayor, one proviso only being made, namely that as far as possible, everything should be of an unostentatious character. On Friday, the 5th of January, 1877, the funeral took place amid such a concourse of people as Yorkshire, or even England, has seldom witnessed. The weather during the week had been unusually severe. The hills and dales in the neighborhood were covered with snow, which on the previous Wednesday was increased by a heavier downfall that impeded the traffic of the streets and threatened to mar the well-laid plans for the mournful ceremony. On the Thursday it was necessary to employ hundreds of men to clear the main thoroughfare for three miles in anticipation of the morrow. But when Friday came, with a magnificent sunrise and a soft breeze, it seemed as if the elements smiled on the bier of him who had often carried sunshine into many a home, and whose life had been signalized by many noble deeds of charity. It was a quarter past nine in the morning when the funeral left Cronest. His attached servants carried the coffin of their late master to the hearse, which, though very handsome, had no funereal plumes and was preceded by a detachment of the West Riding Mounted Constabulary. No morning coaches were provided. The relatives of the deceased followed the hearse in their own private carriages, seven in number. Outside the grounds of Crowness, groups of villagers had assembled to pay the last tribute to him whose living presence had been a blessing to them. On reaching the outskirts of Bradford, the great respect in which the deceased was held was at once observable. Shops were closed, window blinds drawn, and even busy manufactories were silent for a while. 
Manchester Road on both sides was thickly lined with people, the crowd becoming more dense as the centre of the town was approached. But it was at the town hall where the public bodies assembled, and the procession commenced. The wood pavement in front of the hall had been swept and sanded, and the entire area was kept free of people except for those who had to take part in the ceremony. Policemen bearing printed cards on black staves indicated where each of the public bodies had to fall in. The salt statue was tastefully draped with black cloth, and on each side were placed immortelles and festoons of laurel leaves, while inside the railings evergreen plants were grouped at the base. As eleven o'clock approached, the crowd swelled in volume, and every place from which a sight of the procession could be obtained was occupied. Yet the quietness of the scene was broken only by the great bell which boomed out muffled peals at intervals. It seemed as if the well-known punctuality of the deceased was to receive recognition in the arrangements for his funeral, for just as the clock struck eleven, the hearse passed the town hall, halting for a moment in front of the statue. Then the procession moved off in the following order, preceded by the bands of the artillery and rifle volunteers, alternately playing the dead march in Seoul. Detachment of police, Southwest York artillery volunteers, Third West York rifle volunteers, members of the Oddfellow Society and Temperance Societies, the United Kingdom Alliance, Band of Hope Union the Independent Order of Good Templars, the Working Men's Teetotal Association, the Scientific Association, Boards of Health of Neighboring Districts, Board of Guardians, Clergy and Other Ministers of Religion, Licensed Victuallers, Deputations representing the following institutions and public bodies, viz. the Congregational Union of England and Wales, Bradford Ragged Schools, Industrial Schools, Eye and Ear Hospital, Fever Hospital, Nurses Training Institution, Infirmary, Grammar Schools, Mechanics Institute, Merchants, Manufacturers, Tradesmen, and Shopkeepers, Liberal Club, Wholesalers Orphanage, Lancaster Royal Albert Asylum, Mayors of Other Towns, and Gentlemen Representing Other Bodies Than the Above, mayor and members of the town council, members of parliament, and last of all, 126 private carriages. We give these details as an index of the deep and universal respect of the community for him whose name had long been a household word amongst them. Such was the cortege that passed along the streets on the funeral day. But the long crowd of spectators through which it moved was perhaps a still more impressive tribute of affectionate respect. It seemed as if the entire population had assembled as mourners. Among them might be seen old men reverently uncovering as the hearse passed by. Perhaps some of them might be recalling the time when the deceased entered Bradford, unnoticed and unknown. What a contrast! A stranger might have thought a prince had fallen and the people had come to witness the funeral pageant on its way to the tomb of his royal ancestors. There, too, were men of middle age who, as they gazed on the spectacle, and remembered the successful career now ended, must have received an incentive in prosecuting their own life work, while mothers might be seen holding up their little children, who were to tell to another generation something of this great sight. When the boundary of the borough was passed, the Bradford procession officially ended, and that of Shipley and Saltaire began. But many connected with the former proceeded to the destination by another route, and there awaited the arrival of the remains. In the morning of that day, a Sabbath stillness prevailed through Saltaire. For once on a weekday, the powerful engines were motionless, the looms were still, the tide of human life that had daily ebbed and flowed through the gates, was arrested. A greater business was in hand. From the roof of the vast establishment, two flags floated half-mast high, as the symbol of the mournful event that called away the workers from their wonted toils. A like symbol was hoisted from the park, and the whole aspect of the town conveyed the impression that in every house, 
there was one dead as for the rows of almshouses erected by the late baronet their window curtains had never been raised since the day he died released from their ordinary duties the inhabitants of saltaire attired in the garb of mourning went forth in a body to meet the cortege the scene from shipley to the gates of the church was most touching here the most personal character of the lost was apparent and the expression of sorrow more heartfelt two streams of mourners now met and commingled the one commencing at crownest the other at saltaire the difference being that while the former mourned for the deceased as the father of their family the latter sorrowed for him as the father of the community but there were others in the procession sharing that sorrow who represented institutions that had shared his generosity among these were two groups of orphans that attracted much attention the one came from the sailors orphanage at hull the other from the crossley orphanage at halifax it was not until one o'clock that the hearse drew up at the church gates where about forty thousand persons were assembled twelve of the workmen who had been longest in the service of the firm carried the coffin up the avenue to the church preceded by the rev d r cowan the resident minister within the edifice were gathered only those whom an official card from the mayor of bradford permitted to enter it was an assembly of representative men such as are not often brought together in addition to the mayor and corporation there were senators and magistrates merchants and manufacturers artists and scientists politicians of different views and clergy of all denominations among the latter one figure stood out from the rest worthy of special mention inasmuch as while these lines are being penned his own funeral obsequies are about to be observed at york one who is not only a personal friend of the deceased baronet but the unmitred archbishop of congregationalism in yorkshire we refer to the late rev james parsons all these were gathered on this mournful occasion when the coffin had been placed in front of the communion table the rev j thompson read a portion of the burial service the present writer led the congregation in prayer and the rev dr campbell delivered the funeral address the following is an extract the grave is open and waiting to receive all that remains to us of the most marked man amongst us one who has not had his equal in our community one of the fathers of our people whose life was not hid from us in the midst of distance either of time or place who grew with our great growth of which he was both the symbol and demonstration was with us and of us in the industry and ambition of his youth and has passed from the midst of us in the fruitful plenitude and power of a ripe age he was our pride and our boast we are here to bury him and we all and severally feel as if by his removal we had this day sunk into the commonplace and mediocrity of a secondary epoch his life his influence his acts of patriotism and benevolence stretch far and wide but they never enfeebled in the least his attachment to this homestead of his fortunes holding a position of wealth and rank which detaches many from their early connections his personal interest and his old neighbors were as true and their claims as binding upon him in his retirement as when he was in the thick of the struggle the inscription on wren's monument circumspice might be fitly borrowed here where every step of our foot or glance of our eye shows some feature of the force and compass of his life to him human life to be of any account meant work good work work well wrought so as to be sure that it would come to something i cannot remember his doing anything whatever slightingly in commercial social and political questions this was his guiding idea good thorough work it is a great and worthy thing to have raised a family to wealth and rank but the house which bears his name in the town which will long remember him as its pride will only inherit a shred of the legacy this good and great man has conveyed to them if they do not find as he did that the real fruit and reward of wealth is to make it work out the happiness of our neighbors as for his beneficence 
it is impossible ever to know it fully the more conspicuous gifts are but the peaks in higher elevations bearing but a small proportion to the whole mountain mass the main part of it is recorded in no register but is breathed in the still gentle voice of grateful love which has no chance of being heard amid the thunders of applause we are mourning a common loss and it is irreparable we shall not soon look upon his like again it is fit that the worshipful mayor and honorable corporation and all the leaders of the people should render honor to one who in office and out of office was a wise and gracious ruler of men that all forms of charity should bear their flambeau in the vast procession that carries the tried friend of all into the dark tomb that religion in every form should acknowledge this man who with his own special faith had reverent respect for the sincerity of others that the poor the lame the halt and the blind should lend their plaintive strains to the common lament it is now many years since i gathered from himself a comfortable assurance that his soul rested in that ever blessed and divine hope of sinful and suffering man the lord and saviour jesus christ and but a few days ago when the dying invalid with a look of attenuating purity and youthfulness was visibly passing into the light he answered me with that marvellous force of sincerity which marked all his speech that his full and entire hope was in christ we trust in infinite mercy that he now rests with him dear friend farewell go carry him to his rest he has done his work grandly let him sleep and let us all and every one pray that when the great reckoning comes he and we shall have the eager longings of our soul answered by the lord's approval well done good and faithful servant enter thou into the joy of thy lord when the service was over wreaths of flowers which loving hands had prepared were placed on the coffin which was not removed to the mausoleum until the evening but even then it was not out of sight such was the eagerness of the public to pay the last tribute to his memory that the vault was allowed to remain open for several days during which thousands of persons beheld where they had laid him and where the remains of three of his children and a daughter-in-law had previously been placed the annexed illustration gives the interior of the mausoleum which is a chamber of chaste design with tinted light falling from the roof underneath this is the vault a white marble figure represents the angel of the resurrection pointing to a scroll on which is inscribed part of first corinthians fifteen beneath the figure is the memorial tablet of dark granite which now bears the words sir titus salt baronet born september the twentieth eighteen o three died december the twenty ninth eighteen seventy six while above is the text blessed are the dead who die in the lord on the following sunday funeral sermons were preached in memory of the late beloved baronet in various churches both in the neighborhood and at a distance irrespective of denomination at lightcliffe where the family attended the rev j thompson chose as his text matthew twenty five twenty one his lord said unto him well done thou good and faithful servant thou hast been faithful over a few things i will make thee ruler over many things enter thou into the joy of thy lord an extract from the discourse will show the pastor's estimate of the deceased his greatness was the greatness of a great nature rather than of any separate or showy faculty there was no meanness or littleness about anything he did he lifted by the sheer force of his own greatness any matter in which he became vitally interested out of the realm of commonplace and carried it irresistibly forward to final success he moved without effort among great undertakings liberal enterprises and bountiful benefactions what he did and gave was from the level in which he lived and to which other men rise with effort and only for a time he could not be said to be a great reader a great thinker a great talker a great expositor he was better he was a great man having in him something responsive to all these forms of greatness and standing among men he was seen from afar his very immobility for it was the repose of strength 
affording that support in trying times that gave a staying power to the undertakings with which he was identified and which made them ultimately successful men knew always where to find him and came also to trust that the cause to which he lent his name and influence had some just claims to consideration and would finally secede in his personal friendships where he trusted he trusted wholly would not soon forsake one to whom he had given his confidence the rising from one position to another in the social scale had no effect on his friendships the friends of his youth were with him to the close or if not it was they who had fallen asleep or fallen away from him and from those noble enterprises to which he had consecrated his strength and resources he was a pioneer a creator of a new era he showed how the graces of the old feudalism that was being supplanted could be grafted on and exemplified by the men who brought forth and moulded the better age no feudal lord could have set open his doors and offered his resources to the retainers of generations in the way he provided for those that labored under his directions the new era had as it were from the first a grace and benevolence that other social forms have never known or known only in decay and it owed and owes it to the personal characters of the men who laid its foundations and not least to him whose removal we deplore he was always seen to advantage among the people surrounded by them making his way among them and through the path that they with native courtesy made for him he treated them more at last as a benevolent and large-hearted father treats his children than as an employer treats his servants or a leader his followers the grand old chief of the liberal party he was never visited by that illumination that leads backwards nor did he spend one half of his life in undoing and unsaying what the other half had been spent in promoting no he went steadily on and forward and feared not good as these things are that have been realized he believed in a better future yet to be while a decided and consistent nonconformist he was not such by accident nor with any latent misgiving of purpose nonconformity to him meant freedom breath the right of religious life to manifold and various expression without let or hindrance he was ready to take his full share in the work and the responsibility that the fight for freedom and self-rule and religious autonomy involved he was one of the great givers of the age and it is no small part of the glory of congregationalism that it has trained men within its fold whose names as benefactors and princely givers to every good cause are well known the names of the salts crossleys and morleys are sufficient to shed a lustre on any denomination and the catholicity of their benefactions is a sufficient reply to charges of ill liberality or sectarian narrowness he found in the pleasure of doing good a reward and a satisfaction all the rarer that it was known only to god to the recipient himself and to none besides he lived his religion his life was better in its devotion to duty in its simplicity in its uniformity in its devout reverence than any speech like all who have been of any worth in the world he had an abiding reverence for duty for the written word for the supreme master his friends among the ministers were not the restless heralds of change and novelty but men who told simply with great plainness of speech and directness of personal appeal the old old story of the cross of man's need and god's love as his pastor i have to say that during these years of intercourse no shadow ever fell from his lip or life upon my mind to make me troubled or cause me to doubt or make my hands weak or my work a burden he troubled me with no suggestions of superior methods he had no pet plans to which he was committed and now he is gone from us we shall miss him the poor will miss a benefactor and the rich will lose the benefit and the stimulus of his example he will be missed in his own home the home that he had made most beautiful and a synonym for all that is large-hearted open-handed unostentatious and good he will be missed abroad in this great country among all men of all parties and all creeds 
it will be missed by the nation at large true loyal and liberal he will be missed in the day of conflict and on the day of calamity he leaves a name that he is surrounded with an imperishable lustre and he leaves with it a great responsibility to those who succeed in his honors and place men will not easily be reconciled to the word failure in the future in regard to anything he planned or purposed he rests amid the industrial homes and palaces and schools that he created and the people whom he loved in the ages to come the founder of saltaire cannot be forgotten and when men read the record of this in another age they will again and again tell the story of his life whose princely industry and whose wise philanthropy and simple faith shone and shines in the works of his hands during the whole of the agitated and trying week that came to such a fitting climax on friday last the people of this great nation by the various organs of public expression and with little or no distinction of creed or party have said well done the echo comes back from other lands well done may we not accept the augury and believe that the voice of the people is the voice of god that a voice from the divine throne from the midst of the excellent glory has said well done and that again on a greater day and before an assembled universe it will repeat the benediction well done good and faithful servant the service at saltaire church on the same day was conducted by the writer and was of a most impressive character how could it be otherwise in the presence of a bereft and mourning community in the sanctuary associated with the name of the deceased and at the very threshold of his tomb the church proved quite inadequate to accommodate the immense number of persons who desired to gain admission many being unable to proceed further than the porch the choir sang the opening anthem cast thy burden on the lord and he will sustain thee the hymn sung at the funeral friend after friend departs and jesus lives was sung during the service the text was selected from john eleven thirty four where have ye laid him the following is an extract dear brethren let us try to realize what we ourselves are when assembled by this unclosed grave love and skill have prepared it but sin hath rendered it necessary. The manly form we have been wont to look upon with reverence and affection must be buried out of our sight. Sin and death have done their worst upon him, but after this they have no more that they can do. Read there that the earthly house of this tabernacle must be dissolved, that this earth is not our permanent home, and all it can yield us at last is a grave read there the emptiness of wealth and rank and fame and human glory for to this narrow house we must come at last read there that blessed are the dead which die on the lord they rest from their labors and their works do follow them read there that though earth hath claimed his dust heaven hath claimed his spirit and it was not because his noble virtues and princely gifts and large-hearted benevolence unlocked the heavenly gate and secured him an entrance ah no but he entered as a little child trusting only in the merits of the lord jesus christ read there that heaven is gathering into its bosom our friends on earth that are ripest calling home her children whose education is completed that they may possess the inheritance purchased for them by the blood of jesus and though to us earth now is poorer heaven is richer because they are there yes sorrow we must but not as others that have no hope weep we must for they have vanished from our sight but they have gone to the mountains of myrrh and the hills of frankincense until the day break and the shadows flee away but the daybreak anticipated is not for them but for ourselves upon them the sun shall no more go down nor night spread her sable wing nor death cast its gloomy shadow no dreams cannot picture a world so fair sorrow and death may not enter there time doth not breathe on its fadeless bloom for beyond the clouds and beyond the tomb it is there 
it is there but in the arrangements for the memorial services of the sunday the children of saltaire were not forgotten they had ever occupied a large place in the heart of the deceased and an opportunity was given on this mournful occasion of manifesting their love for his memory a special service was held in the assembly room of the new sunday schools which will long be remembered by the crowd of young people who there were gathered special hymns were sung and the sermon preached by the writer was taken from jeremiah three four wilt not thou from this time cry unto me my father thou art the guide of my youth. Thus he was honored in his burial. Since that day several memorials of him have appeared, but the most recent are two beautiful windows of stained glass placed in the congregational church, Lightcliff, the one being a tribute of love from his surviving children, and the other of respect by his friends. The visitor, entering the works of Saltaire by the western gates, will observe a board on which the names of the gentlemen constituting the firm are inscribed. Opposite each name is inserted a movable slide, indicating which members of the firm are at the time out or in. The name of the late baronet is the first on that board, but opposite it will be seen the word out. How suggestive of the question! Where is he? He has gone out to return no more. Out! for the toils of business are over, and he has gone home to rest, out, for he hath passed from time into eternity, from the land of shadows into the regions of endless day. Thus may it be with a reader, when his work on earth is done, not cast upon the shores of another world without any definite hope beyond the present, but like him whose career we have traced, may his faith rest on the rock of ages, then shall life be serene and useful, death peaceful, and heaven secure. Finis. End of chapter 20. End of Sir Titus Salt, Baronet, His Life and Its Lessons, by Robert Bulgarney.